The first line of his book sums up what so many people think is gross about life inside the Washington, D.C. Beltway. Quote, Tim Russert is dead, but the room was alive. Mark Leibovich has been capturing so much of what stinks in American politics from his perch as chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine. He's now put it all together in a simultaneously wonderful and appalling new book called This Town. Two parties and a funeral, plus plenty of valet parking in America's gilded capital. And Mark Leibovich joins us now from Washington, D.C. It's great to have you on the broadcast. How are you, Mark? I'm great. How are you, Steve? Good to be here. Just terrific. Well, you've written a book that obviously has a very acerbic look at how things work in the American capital city. Lots of people presumably could have written this book but didn't. Why did you? Um, I think I have a death wish or I wanted to be driven out of town or something. <laughs> no, I mean, a lot of people ask me that. I mean, it was definitely uh, a big risk. I mean, it, it names some names and it, um, I guess it gives away the secret handshake of that people who are on the inside, as I am, as someone who's attached to a major news organization, are not supposed to speak ill of others on the inside. But I did think that, that there was a level of... Uh, frankly, decadence and self-celebration that had grown up here in Washington at a time when the rest of the country was really resenting the place. And I wanted to really flesh out the disconnect and, and hopefully um, educate people outside the Capitol on, on what had been going on here. I gave away the first line of the book talking about the former moderator, the now deceased moderator of Meet the Press, uh, Tim Russert. What did you find particularly troubling about the way people were behaving at his funeral? Well, I mean, this was a funeral for a beloved newsman, a solemn event, ostensibly. And um, the first, you know, clue that I had that this was a quintessentially um, unsacred event. I mean, a sacred event, but people were acting in an unsacred way. Was that uh, I actually someone someone um, scalping tickets outside the Kennedy Center to a funeral? Uh, you had people networking and throwing business cards around. I had someone run up to Hillary Clinton and actually try to book her on a cable show that night. Um, just watching the spectacle, watching this thing devolve into a cocktail party, uh, really you know, indicated to me that, that, again, we had reached a tipping point, and I wanted to tell the story um, you know, over, over a four- or five-year period to really, again, bring it to life for people. Anybody lobbying for his role at that funeral? <laughs> uh, for Tim's role, yes. In fact, there were. I mean, there were a couple of people. Uh, apparently, I, I didn't put it in the book because I couldn't nail it down. I don't want to name names here. But, um, yeah, no, apparently the, the, the race to succeed Tim Russer was underway at his funeral. A lot of NBC executive, executives were there. And um, they were, um, let's just say they had a lot of company up at the, the after events and, and in the aisles beforehand. Hmm. Now, you called Tim the mayor of Washington, D.C. because he had that kind of role in the city. His son, Luke, uh, kind of exploded onto the public's, uh, into the public's imagination, speaking so eloquently about his dad there, and then got a job, of course, at NBC shortly thereafter. Uh, have you right. heard from Luke Russert uh, since the book's come out? I, in fact, I have. I mean, Luke was actually okay with the portrayal. I mean, Luke was there. Um, Luke, I mean, like his dad, is very much aware of the world around him, and, and he understands the game, which is, um, again, I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing to lose your father, especially so suddenly, especially when you're as close as Luke and Tim were. But he also knew that, that you know, a lot of what was going on at the funeral and in the extended mourning period was was not so much about Tim, but it was about... The, the rush to, to sort of climb the pecking order in his absence, in Tim's absence. And, um, and Luke, you know, again, he was raised well, and he was raised to know um, and to sort of view somewhat skeptically the behaviors of Washington. And, and Luke essentially launched his career that day with a great eulogy. Now, it wasn't, a, I don't think he was insincere, and I think he was obviously devastated by the loss, but he also knew what was going on. Are there people in Washington who are... I don't know what the right word is, but let's say upset about the fact that Luke Russert has, I mean, he won the lottery in a way because of that eulogy he gave at his father's death. He, he, he got a job way ahead of a lot of other people who've been laboring for years to get that same job. He, he did. I mean, there, uh, one blogger refers to him as the nepotist prince of Washington. And, and no, absolutely. I mean, half the city has been sort of snarking at this guy as he has at a very young age. I mean, he would be the first to admit, you know, before his, his, he's ready, uh, has a very, very big job co covering Capitol Hill for a major news organization and very, very visible. Um, 
He obviously has a lot of privilege and a lot of wealth. So, yeah, I think he's handled it okay. And he also, again, his this is someone, his father, who he used to talk to several times a day. And, um, you know, this was a tough blow for him. So beyond the theatrics that people sort of impose upon him um, is, I think, a real human story and, and one that I think he's handled pretty gracefully. Okay, let me get your take on sort of the quintessential although there are many, but these two are as good as any. The power couple in Washington, D.C., Andrea Mitchell, the NBC correspondent and anchor, and her husband, Alan Greenspan, who used to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve. This is a couple right. that clearly find themselves um, in conflict of interest situations all the time, but they're married to each other, and they like their jobs, so what are they supposed to do? Well, look, I mean, this, I mean, nothing, first of all. I mean, if two people are in love, they... I mean, they should get married and they should be together. I think the point I was trying to make with Andrea and with Alan Greenspan is when you are a major news reporter, as Andrea is for NBC News, you can't draw the lines as clearly as you think. I mean, obviously, everything that she was covering for a time was impacted by the U.S. economy, by the world economy, and, and her husband was probably the most powerful actor in, in influencing that. So the lines of, okay, well, I cover foreign policy here, and I'm covering the campaign here, and I'm not covering the Federal Reserve, are not as cleanly drawn. Um, basically, they are emblematic of a couple whose personal lives, whose social lives, whose professional lives um, are completely interwoven. And they essentially just, I mean, they have the same friends who are also their sources. And I wanted to look in the book at, at what it means in the anthropology of insider, sort of incestuous Washington, and what they meant to it. But you can't really tell her you can't cover the economy as long as your husband's chairman of the Fed, and you can't say to him you can't go on NBC as long as she's there. So they really can't do much well, about that, can they? Well, they can't. Well, they tried to say you can't cover the economy. I mean, to Andrea Mitchell specifically. I mean, when the economy crashed in 2008, Andrea was you know she was host of a, a pretty widely watched television show on NBC or MSNBC. She was covering the presidential campaign. And obviously the economy had become a very, very big issue. And even though Alan Grants, Greenspan wasn't the Fed chair anymore, clearly his policies um, had a great deal of influence on what had ultimately happened. So yes, yeah, she could say, I'm covering the campaign, but the campaign was about the economy. And, and in fact, you know, she tried to be very, very clear. I am not an economics reporter, but that's just not how the world works these days. I mean, if you're a campaign reporter, you're an economics reporter. You, uh, I think one of the best examples you give of the incestuous relationship between big lobbying and big media is the, the story about one of the biggest lobbyists in town throwing a birthday party for the executive producer of Meet the Press. What don't you like about that? Yeah. Um, I, I, I thought that it was very, again, very emblematic how everyone is feeding from the same trough. I mean, this was uh, Betsy Fisher, who was a longtime executive producer for Meet the Press. She no longer is, but she was, you know, a real player at NBC. Very, very powerful gatekeeper to help people get on Meet the Press if they wanted to. Uh, Jack Quinn, one of the major Democratic lobbyists in town, hosted a birthday party for her when she turned 40. People in the Obama administration showed up. They ran a campaign, you know, essentially against the lobbying Washington insider culture that they were now embraced by and were embracing. Uh, you had Republicans there. Um, again, it was emblematic of the fact that this is not so much a city divided, as many people say, as, he, as it is a city that's hopelessly interconnected. And, and there's really one party, and the party is often a party, as, as I chronicled in the book. I mean, there was a very sort of uh, bonfire of the vanities, um, you know, sort of almost, uh, you know, sort of a go-go, boomtown economy feel to a lot of the scenes I covered. Do the people who are a part of that life, though, do they, in your view, understand that they are leading lives that are unlike 99.99% of Americans? I think they know it, certainly. Um, I mean, I suppose they understand it. I, I think what people are not self-aware enough about here First of all, is the appearance of it. I mean, in two weeks, we're going to have the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which is this annual uh, extravaganza that that is you know, that celebrates all of the achievements of the Washington media and the Washington political class. And it's not just one dinner. It uh, goes over five days, and it's a couple dozen parties. And it costs tens of millions of dollars to put on the various news organizations pitching in. And, I mean, what are we celebrating exactly? I mean, this is, again, a city that is held in very low esteem by voters across the country. The major institutions, whether, whether it's the press or the Democratic Party or the, the Republican Party or Congress, 
Congress, um, what have you, are, are really being reviled. And I don't quite know why people feel that they can just go on celebrating and it's on national TV and, and what the message is here. So I, I think we really ought to you know, reconsider a lot of, the, um, a lot of the, the behaviors and a lot of the ethic that has sort of grown up in Washington when you know, really we forget that this is a city that supposedly was built on public service. Mm. Even Tom Brokaw has said he can't go to it anymore. He thinks it's gotten too gross, right? He said, if you go, it will steal your soul. <laughs> you don't go, I take it. Uh, well, the New York Times, uh, we started not going in 2007, so I can sit here and be um, holier than thou and say that, <laughs> um, no, I would never attend such a thing, even though, um, full disclosure, I did attend uh, before the boycott went into place. And it was fun, I bet, wasn't it? You know, it was interesting. I think after the first couple, it got a little old. And, and um, I think if, if you're a journalist, you can get a lot of work done. There's a lot of very, very important newsmakers and people, you know, of serious influence who are all in the same room. And, um, you know, you can set up appointments and stuff. But no, I mean, ultimately, it, it's, um, there's a soul-crushing sameness to it. And it's pretty surreal. And maybe part of the surrealness is... Uh, that the way a lot of people handle it is just to drink a lot, and that was sort of my M.O. <laughs> when I used to go. But it's, um, look, I mean, it, it's not, I, I don't judge people for going. I just think that it's something that should be, uh, frankly, discontinued. Mark, one of the issues you look into is who owns Washington nowadays, and I think one of the most staggering statistics I read in the book was that in 1974, 4% of former politicians went into lobbying. Now, 50% of senators and 42% of congressmen go into lobbying once their careers are over. Why such a significant change from back in the day? Well, I mean, there are a few things going on. I mean, first of all, Washington, or Washington has become sort of a permanent feudal class. I mean, the, the notion that you come to Washington, you serve the nation, and then you go home to your farm or your medical practice or your shop or what have you is very quaint. I mean, what we have here, especially over the last three decades, is a, is a city that has been completely given over to moneyed interest. I mean, this is the wealthiest metropolitan area in the United States now. It's home to seven of the top, uh, the wealthiest 10 counties in the United States. And people stay. I mean, no one goes home anymore. And when you're in office, it is very, very easy to, to make a you know, fairly high seven-figure salary um, as soon as you leave office. So the money is available to senators now that wasn't 30, 40 years ago. And so I think that's one of the big reasons. But also I think, look, I mean, people are, more people are paying attention to influence in Washington. I mean, corporations far more so now than they did 40 years ago. Even the media now. And, and I think new media is a part of this too because there's a greater focus on, on the goings on here. But I mean, Washington has become essentially a very business town and a place that, again, people come to get rich. Let's do a couple of examples here. Chris Dodd, his father was a senator. He was a senator. He swore when he left the Senate he would not go into lobbying. What happened to Chris Dodd? Well, you can guess how this story ends. I mean, Chris Dodd, you know, long time, you know, pretty liberal Democratic senator from Connecticut, uh, promised a number of people, including me, um, in 2010 he would never lobby. Uh, then he got out of Congress, got out of the Senate, and um, Lo and behold, the Motion Pictures Association of America, which is one of the most powerful lobby, it represents the entertainment industry in Hollywood, uh, offered him, I guess, what's now $3 million a year. That was his annual salary last year. So lo and behold, he's a lobbyist. I mean, look, he's allowed to change his mind. He's allowed to make a living. And I'm allowed as a journalist to be um, cynical about it. But that goes on all the time. I mean, again, I, I don't know what he was thinking then versus now. But I mean, that's a fairly routine two-step that, that we have to you know, deal with here. And that happens you know, all the time. And have you seen him since he took the job? You know, I have, um, let's see. I've seen him since he's taken the job. I don't think I've seen him since the book came out. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what his response would be. But um, yeah, no, look, I mean, it's all pretty transparent, I think. I mean, we know what he's making. And, and I think you know, he made a choice. And I guess um, you know, more power to him. Well, here's another guy, Dick Gephardt. Dick Gephardt was always for the little guy when he was in Congress. He represented one of those great middle American constituencies. And here's you in your book, This Town, saying he supported a House resolution condemning the Armenian genocide of 1915, only to oppose the resolution as a lobbyist who was being paid about $70,000 a month by the Turkish government, according to the Washington Post. Genocide goes down a little easier at those rates. <laughs> what happened to Dick yeah, Gephardt? It, 
Well, I mean, basically what you just said illustrates it perfectly. I mean, that's that happened on a number of events. I mean, a number of occasions. I mean, when he ran for tre president twice in 1988 and again in 2004, um, some of the most impassioned labor rallies I've ever attended as a political reporter uh, were for him. And there was this great Teamsters rally, I remember, in 2004 in Iowa that he was at. And his, uh, he was the son of a milkman. He was a Teamster. I mean, he really talked the talk. And I think he just made a decision that as soon as he got out of politics, he was going to change course and basically just sell himself to the highest bidder, whether they were um, helping the labor movement or helping the little guy or uh, helping, um, you know, Armenia or, or what have you. I mean, that sort of, I mean, I, I guess I have a grudging appreciation, if not respect, for, for Dick Gephardt's willingness to be pretty bald about it. I mean, he doesn't try to couch it in any great self-righteous um, explanation, but still, it's demoralizing to watch. But that's the thing I'm really trying to get a better handle on. How does somebody who is one way and has one set of views for all of his political life, and then the second his career is over, he goes into lobbying and basically reverses himself on some pretty significant points of departure. How does a guy like that yeah. look at himself in the mirror the day after? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, I, look, I'm not in a position to know. I haven't talked to Dick Gephardt. I mean, I'm sure he would have a justification for it. Um, you know, he would say that he served however many years in Congress. He made a government salary. Of course, it's like higher than, you know, probably 95 percent of all Americans make. But no, I don't know how you live with yourself. I mean, I guess my only thought is that when you're in office, what you think about is getting reelected. And when you get out of office, what you think about is getting paid for it. And, you know, somewhere in all that is your principles if you had them. But again, um, one of the really, really upsetting things about, you know, seeing this happen over and over and over again is it makes you cynical and it's not fun to be cynical. And, you know, when you're a reporter in Washington, you become cynical because you're talked to in a certain way and that's part of the process. But, um, yeah, I mean, it does. I think lately we've had a lot more instances of, of it hitting you over the head. And, and again, part of this book was, was cataloging that. If the town is so, I'm not going to pretend this is an original question here. I know you've been asked it a thousand times, but I still want to hear the answer. If the town is so phony and so full of BS, why don't you get out of there and go do something real for a living? <laughs> well, I like to think I do something real for a living. I that mean, was a I bad think, choice you know, of word. Part of, something different. Well, it's fine. Well, no, I, I, I think I like what I do. I mean, I think journalism is a, a very noble cause, and I think part of your job as a journalist is to um, you know, be transparent and, and try to shine a light on a culture that, that people uh, might not know as well as they should and, and might not be as outraged about um, as they know you should. And I think, look, the book has struck a major nerve, and that's been really gratifying. I mean, there was a lot of people who thought that this was going to be just, you know, only, you know, only resonant to about, you know, a few hundred insiders. Um, and, but it's satisfying to do a job that you actually can reach beyond the bubble of the Beltway and actually, you know, inform people around the country and around the world. I mean, uh, I've heard from people in, in capital cities all over the world, uh, including Ottawa, Canada, um, you know, encouraging me to do, you know, versions of this town for, you know, places like Paris and Munich and Ottawa. So I, I'm not planning on doing any of it, but I, I think that that's satisfying and I think that's central to what we do as journalists. Well, I guess the reason more people don't do what you've done is that they're convinced that if they do do that, they'll be completely shut out of, you know, access to information, access to people, you'll never eat lunch in this town again, that kind of thing. Has that right. happened to you? I, I would say the opposite has happened to me. I mean, there are people who I'm sure are trashing me behind my back and, and I know, look, I mean, there are people who I don't think will be happy to receive me in their homes anytime soon. But by and large, I think people have appreciated, you know, a book that, that many people have said have been overdue. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff has been sitting there waiting for someone to write about just because people have been complaining about it and people know intuitively that, that the world that we've been living in here is, has really gone over the edge and is frankly corrupt. So. Um, so, it, look, it has not, the, the you'll never have lunch in this town again fear has not been realized. And, uh, and actually, the paperback for this town is coming out in a few weeks. And we, um, the publisher bought these ads to go on the sides of buses. And the, the caption for the ad is, you will always eat lunch in this town again. <laughs> and uh, that's not about me. That's about so much. It's basically about how there is no real fall from grace in Washington. And... It is a very, very soft landing place, and, and it's become a very, very easy city. 
Now tell me this, your, your critics obviously are going to say, wait a second, this is a guy who worked for the New York Times and the Washington Post, and if he's not exhibit number one for what's going on with, you know, problems in Washington, D.C., then maybe he's exhibit number two. Uh, do they have a point? Um, I would say no, because, again, I mean, I, I look, I'm, I'm very, very evangelical about journalism. I mean, I, I do criticize the media somewhat in this book, but I think... Look, print journalism is my tribe, and I'm very proud of the institutions I've worked for. And, um, you know, I would like to think that on good days or on most days we stand above this and, and are hoping, you know, or hopefully we're informing people about what's going on, about people in power. But, but, I mean, look, the central critique of this book is that it made people uncomfortable here, which I welcome. And um, I think, you know, the journalism, the, really the, the first job as a journalist is to make people uncomfortable. And I don't, again, I, I don't claim to be a foreign correspondent. I don't claim to be someone who doesn't live here. Um, but this is the perspective I write from. And I don't have, a, you know, I don't have the choice of being um, someone who, who can be an outsider because that's not who I am. No, but have you found that your life has changed since you wrote the book? I wonder if you are, are sort of a little more part of that she-she crowd now. Your book's probably going to get turned into a oh. movie. You're going to be, you know... <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, I, I don't think so. I mean, first of all, that was never a part of my life. I mean, I, the only reason, I mean, look, most of the reasons I would go to these things was just for work purposes, because I would learn a lot, and there are people I genuinely like to see. Um, but, uh, look, I mean, what's interesting is I have actually been invited to a ton of stuff, like at the upcoming Correspondence Weekend now, which is hilarious, because... I don't know. I guess it just shows to sh goes to show you that if your name is in lights and if people know who you're, who you're, if they recognize your brand, I mean, you're considered someone who is welcome at the party. Which, again, I think is a data point that that might you know help, you know, corroborate some of the things I was writing about. But <laughs> now I'm not really worried about that. Mark, if Tim Russert was the mayor of Washington and he's no longer there, who's the new mayor? Uh, well, her name, uh, newly elected mayor, is, her name is uh, Muriel Bowser. No, um, I don't mean her. Was, I mean, uh, I know she's oh, the official oh, the new mayor. mayor. Oh, okay. I mean, who's in inverted Sorry. commas the Took new mayor of Washington? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, in a sense, Tim died and he's been replaced by this anarchy in the peanut gallery, which, um, you know, again, it's, he's been replaced by Twitter. He's been replaced by a lot of the new media forces that have empowered um, a whole new breed of journalists. I mean, I think Mike Allen who writes this you know, daily tip sheet by email called Playbook, which everybody reads, which impacts the conversation throughout the day on television, on radio, on blogs. For Politico. Um, is probably, for Politico, right. Um, he is probably someone that, that really controls a lot of the um, sort of the hearth of the morning or the, the morning breakfast table, the virtual breakfast table. Um, you know, about 100,000 people read it, but there are 100,000 of the right people. These are 100,000 mm -hmm. People who, um, again, book shows, who make decisions about what's going to be in the newspaper, what's going to be on the nightly news. So I would say that uh, Mike Allen, who is known as Mikey, who was a distinctive figure in his own right and also a pretty big part of this book, um, has the current mantle of mayor. But who knows? It could be different next year. He's a different kind of mayor because where Russert was very much of Buffalo, New York, and a very gregarious guy and patch on the back, I think I've read in your stuff, like, Mikey is a different guy, right? He doesn't want anybody to know anything about his personal life, and he's very secretive, et cetera? Right. Yeah, no, Mike is a very uh, sort of eccentric guy. He's extremely private. No one knows where he lives. I mean, there are all these stories about, you know, being in cabs with him and then waiting for you to get off and then having the cab go in the other direction, and you never know where he's going to go. Um, look, I mean, he is, I mean, like a lot of journalists, he's, he is, um, you know, he's a little not like, I mean, he's, I don't want to use the word eccentric again, but maybe say eclectic and his <laughs> habits. Um, but look, I mean, what he has and what his skill set is, which is incredible speed, which is an ability seemingly not to sleep, um, is just a, a, he's become an information faucet that comes out in a very, very presentable, and very, very readable way every morning that has gained quite a foothold in, uh, in this town. Mm -hmm. A couple of minutes to go here, Mark. I want to touch on two more things. First of all, I wonder whether you have received feedback from people who are not upset that they are in the book, but are upset because they're not in the book. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, no. I think more people were probably um, aggrieved not to be in the book. I and mean, what's interesting, there's a, there's a tag on the back of the hardcover of the book, which says that this book does not include an index. And the reason it doesn't include an index is that this, there's something called the Washington Read, which is, um, 
a, uh, it's a practice of people going to bookstores, immediately thumbing to the index, seeing if they're in there, and if they're not, throwing the book back on the shelf, unpurchased, because, you know, how could a book be important if they're not in it? So I wanted people to actually read the book. Um, a day after it came out, the Washington Post um, thwarted me by, by running their own online index, mentioning all 742 people who were mentioned in the book um, <laughs> and what chapter they appear on. So then the next day, you you know, Twitter was lighting up with people saying, hey, can someone who has a copy of the book see why I'm mentioned in chapter five? And if it's bad, please um, just direct message it. Don't tweet it back. So again, <laughs> a, a very, very reinforcing data point that went on um, with the online index. And in our last 30 seconds, Mark, do you think there's any hope for Washington at all? I, I hope so. I mean, look, I, I think that we are at a tipping point. I think that we've actually seen with some of the, the, you know, the debt ceiling negotiations and you know, we have a budget finally next year. And I, I, you know, maybe the fever is breaking a little bit, but I don't think that what we have here, the disconnect between the rest of the country and the capital city, both in terms of wealth and sensibility and outlook is sustainable. And so I'm, I'm hoping that eventually you know, self-interest will prevail and it usually does. Well, you absolutely nailed it. In this town, two parties and a funeral, plus plenty of valet parking in America's gilded capital. Mark Leibovich, awfully good of you to join us on TVO tonight from Washington, D.C. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.